Good evening. My name is Mark Stein. I'm the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. And I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to our evening services for Sunday, August the 7th. We will sing, we will observe the Lord's Supper, and I'll have a lesson for you that I hope will be uh, interesting and hopefully, again, beneficial to each of us. We are singing from our songbooks that we use, Songs of Faith and Praise. So if you do not have that book but want to sing, I will give you the title of the song so that you can look it up in your book or uh, Google it so that you can sing along with us. The first song that we will sing is Spirit of the Living God. Spirit of the Living God and Songs of Faith and Praise. That is number 422, 422, Spirit of the Living God. We will sing it through twice. <clears throat> Spirit of the Living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Mount me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me, mount me, mold me, fill me, use me, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Number 296, we have come into his house, 296. We have come into his house. <clears throat> we have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship him. 
Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. And before we observe the Lord's Supper, Let's sing number 350, When My Love for Christ Grows Weak. 350. We'll sing verses 1. Two, three, and four. We'll omit number five. <clears throat> when my love for Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I seek, then in thought I go to Garden of Gethsemane, there I walk amid the shades, while the lingering twilight fades. See the suffering, friendless one, Weeping, praying, there alone. When my love for man grows weak, when for stronger faith I seek, hill of Calvary I go. To the scenes of fear and woe, there behold his agony, suffered on the bitter tree. See his anguish, see his vanity. Love dry on, but still in death. At this time, we will gather around the Lord's table. Uh, I think the song says a lot about uh, our devotion to the Lord in that he gave his life for us. We're looking for a deeper faith, and we find that faith in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed alone. We find that faith uh, uh, in the uh, giving of his life on Calvary. And the, uh, the writer of the song describes it to scenes of fear and woe. And uh, the fourth verse talks about beholding his agony that he suffered on the bitter tree. And when we see his anguish and we see his faith, we see that love was triumphant, even in death. And so what we see here is that in dying, the Lord was triumphant. Even though the Lord gave up his life, he gave up his life with purpose. He gave up his life with sacrifice. And so when we gather around the table, we think of the sacrifice, but we think of the triumph. He triumphed for you and for me. He triumphed that our sins might be forgiven. He triumphed that grace may come upon us. He triumphed so that the Lord's mercy would be shown to us. And so as we can't gather about the table and we partake of these emblems of his body and his blood, let's remember our, our triumphal Jesus, our triumphal Savior. Let's pray for the bread. 
our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that Jesus was willing to uh, leave your side and come to earth in the form of a human. Uh, we know that under the Old Testament law, there were sacrifices that were given to you. <clears throat> but Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, as was predicted. We are just humbled and awed by that sacrifice and the knowledge that through that sacrifice that we might live. Be with us as we partake. We pray it in his most holy name. Amen. As we partake of the cup, let's remember that Jesus' blood flowed from his body. That innocent blood. The innocent blood that... Uh, serve to us as the agent for forgiveness of sin. Let's pray. We're just so thankful, dear Heavenly Father, that your son was willing to uh, shed that innocent blood, that it flowed from him, and death, physical death, overcame him because of it. But we know that through that blood flow, that um, in him we have forgiveness. Help us to understand that as we gather about the table to make it more and more significant each time. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. We're also told on each first day of the week to lay by in store that with which we have been blessed. And uh, we are to give that back to the Lord. We know that what we give back to the Lord is his anyway, that uh, all that we have comes from our God. And so as we give, let's reflect uh, why we're giving so that the Lord's work can be spread, so that those who are in need can be helped and help our church to be just stewards of the monies that are given so that... Uh, so that your kingdom will be extended further and further. Let's pray for the giving. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the uh, uh, time that we have that we can give back to you. Help us to be grateful givers. Help us to give with gratitude. Help us to think of that widow uh, uh, that gave of those two little small coins all that she had and the sacrifice that she made, what we think of the sacrifice that we make when we put our money into uh, the plate. Bless us in our giving. I pray this in his most holy name. Amen. And if you would, the last song we'll sing is number 172. I just came to praise the Lord. 172. I just came to praise the Lord. <clears throat> I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to praise His holy name. I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to thank the Lord. I just came to thank the Lord. I just came to praise His holy name. I just came to thank the Lord. I just came to love the Lord. I just came to love the Lord. I just came to praise His holy name. I just came to love the Lord. That concludes our song service. And uh, now uh, we're going to have a, a lesson. Uh, if you were there this morning, uh, you uh, probably remembered the 
title was perhaps a, a little bit unusual, but uh, I try to do that sometimes to pique interest. The title of uh, the lesson this evening is Information, Revelation, and Inspiration. Now, everybody knows that uh, when we look at our Bibles, we, we know that there uh, is lots and lots and lots of information. It's a big book. However, the Bible also uses the terms revelation and inspiration when discussing the information that's contained in our uh, word of God. And we need to kind of have an understanding of these words in order to have faith in the Bible and have more trust in what it has to say to us. All right, let's start in talking about our Bible and understanding that the information in the Bible uh, came from several sources. Now, some of the sources were personal experience. When Jesus was written about, we learned about the personal experiences of Jesus. When the Apostle Paul wrote, he talked about personal experience experiences. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 and 25, he said, five times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked a night and a day. I spent in the deep. He, he told of things that physically happened to them. And so he got that information from personal experiences. Now, let's look at the book of Acts, which was written by Luke, uh, the same uh, author of the uh, third gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We know that Luke was, even though he was a disciple, uh, we know that uh, he was not an apostle. And he got his information a different way. Let's take a look at uh, Luke chapter 1. Uh, let's took a, take a look at, at the book of Acts where uh, Paul, uh, okay, I'll get this all straightened out. When Luke references someone named Theophilus, it says, inasmuch as Many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the Lord. It seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, O oh, most excellent Theophilus. Since Luke was not an apostle, he didn't spend three years with the Lord like John did. He didn't spend three years with the Lord as, uh, 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 as Matthew did. He was not there. He had to gain his personal information in a different way, yet he gathered those from those that had been with Jesus. Now, we know that Luke penned the book of Acts, which is a record of the spread of the gospel in the first century and the establishment of congregations, you know, all over the known world during the maybe the first 30 years after Christ ascended into heaven. Some of the information that Luke records, he learned because he was there. Now, we can always tell that when we read the book of Acts by the personal pronouns. If he says, I, it means that Luke was there. If he uses we or us, it means he was there. However, there were times when he was not there, and so he used they as the personal pronoun. He had opportunities to investigate and personally interview people uh, about whom he wrote in the book of Acts. Let me give you an example. In the eighth chapter of Acts, we have that wonderful story of the Ethiopian uh, who was converted. 
That is Acts chapter 8, verses 27 to 40. Now, many years later, according to Acts chapter 21, verses 8 and 9, it says that Luke spent time in the house of Philip. Philip was the one who was in the chariot with the Ethiopian. He probably had the opportunity to discuss this with Luke. And so when Luke wrote the story of the conversion of the Ethiopian, there's a good chance that this writing came from his having been with Philip himself. Now, the third amount of information that we have in the Bible is information given by revelation. This would be, this would be information that the writers didn't know through their human knowledge or through their human investigation. Now understand, if that happens, we're told. Take a look at Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 to 5. Here's what Paul writes. That by revelation there was made known to me the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. Understand, Paul was not with Jesus. Paul, who was known as Saul, was that uh, one who persecuted Christians. And so he did not get his information like John would have gotten it by actually walking with Jesus. And so when Jesus selected Paul to be an apostle, he had to be given information. Paul says that readily. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, Paul says, For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hmm. That's pretty good stuff, isn't it? Let's get to inspiration. Inspiration. Have you ever been inspired to do something? Not exactly the same thing, but I just thought that I would throw that in so we have that word inspiration or inspired rolling around in our brains. Inspiration was the process whereby God guided the apostles and prophets when they spoke to make sure that what they presented was accurate. That's why we call our Bibles the Holy Spirit, ready, inspired Word of God. It's vital to everyone's salvation that they're receiving the right information. And so it would have been humanly impossible for all of the writings in the New Testament to have been written by those who walked with Jesus for three years. And by the way, Jesus knew that. And not only did he know that, but in those three years, can you, can you remember everything that someone says to you? Of course not. You know, as wonderful as our brains are, we're not able to remember each and every detail of everything someone says. When I was a teacher and I, I explained a lesson, I, I put notes on the board to highlight the important parts. And so even though they wouldn't know everything that I spoke, maybe within the framework of 20 or 25 minutes, they would have the skeleton of that in a set of notes. Now, Jesus one-upped me <laughs> on writing my notes. In John chapter 14 and verse 26, 
and the apostles, and these were the disciples at this time, uh, didn't, I don't think, get this, but they would. He said to them, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, get this, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Isn't that, isn't that neat? Now, Jesus went on to say something that I also think was very interesting in the 16th chapter of the book of John, when he said, I have many more things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And so they would have a helper. They would have the Holy Spirit. And many times when they spoke, the words that flowed out of them, flowed out of them through the Holy Spirit. Now, the term inspiration, um, if you know anything about uh, human anatomy, um, we inspire and expire air. All right. We take air in. In biological terms, that's called inspiration. We give air back out. That's called expiration. Inspiration means God breathe. God allowed the people in the New Testament who wrote to write in their own vocabulary. Some of the men were fairly simple men. John was a simple man. Man, uh, Peter was a, a fisherman. Yet Paul and Luke were educated men. We know that Paul studied for years and years. We knew that Luke was a physician. And they wrote and used the language very often uh, of more educated men. That being the said, said, they did this through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Now, how important is that? It's so important that when Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, probably words that you have read and heard in sermons over and over again. He says, but know this first of all. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm jumping ahead of myself. He said, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable by teaching. It's, it's, it's God breathed for teaching, for re, uh, reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that every man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. Why? Because of the inspired teachings of God through the Holy Spirit. Now, a little later on, Peter wrote this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but made by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Interestingly enough, it says men moved by the Holy Spirit, right? Those that wrote our New Testament were moved by the Holy Spirit. You know what? It's like a sailing ship. You put a, a, the old time sailing ships like Columbus and Magellan and those guys used, they had no motors on them. They, they depended entirely upon the wind. If that ship was in the middle of a sea and the wind stopped, the only way that the boat would move is if there was some current. And so they were at the mercy of whatever little current there was. And so they were dependent upon the air to fill to fill the sails so that the boats could move. And that's the way uh, the word of God uh, worked. The Bible didn't come by the power of men, by the, but by the, <laughs> literally the blowing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was the air that moved those men to write. 
Now, all that being said, what we have and uh, the, the wonderful book that we have here that we call our Bible is a trustworthy account of God. Why? It came through investigation. It came through revelation. And it came through inspiration, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Now, here's a question. That being said, do we have all the information God wants us to have? Yes. However, then the ball is hit into our court. A book is useless unless we turn the pages and we read it. In other words, to the point that we read and meditate on the word of God is the point to which we come to understand those proofs, those proofs that came through investigation, those proofs that came through revelation, and those proofs that came through inspiration. And so we kind of ask ourselves the question, it takes work, doesn't it? How do I do this? You know, we know in, a, in, in biology, there's a process called um, osmosis that goes on where things move because of the very nature of them. They move from regions of higher concentration to regions of lower concentration. It's just the way they move. If you have a hose and you have a gradient out there in the road and you run the hose, the water will run downhill. How it will always do that. The water won't run back uphill. And what that means is that there's something that has to be done. We need to study and take the effort to read this wonderful book. And more important, more important, understanding that it came through investigation, that it came through revelation, and it came through inspiration. We can adhere to the words of Paul in Ephesians chapter three, verse four, when he said, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. The Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write these words that were understandable. And we are blessed in these Bibles that we have. We are blessed that we have the truth of God's word, which God saw to it was given to us through the investigation of some of his workers who wrote by sheer revelation that it was given to them and then by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's an amazing thing that we have and we ought to always give thanks for that book that gives us the spirit of God's word to which to guide our lives. And so as we conclude, uh, I just ask if, if uh, God is guiding your life, if you have obeyed uh, uh, God into salvation through Jesus Christ, then you know that you've begun your walk. But if you haven't, if you haven't repented and confessed and been baptized for the remission of your sins, that's when you begin your walk. And that's when these words in our Bibles take on even more powerful meaning to us. If you need to come to the Lord this evening, uh, this invitation is given to you. Uh, you have but to call one of us and we will be there uh, to help you. Let's all pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the truths that we find in your Holy Spirit-inspired uh, Bible. We hopefully, as we uh, learned a bit of this lesson, we know some of the ways that this information was compiled and how it came down to us as scripture, as given by inspiration for teaching and for reproof 
and rebuke so that all men may be able to share that word uh, uh, and share it with others. Bless us as we reflect upon our Bibles and help us to understand it as your word, Holy Spirit inspired for us to guide our lives. Continue to be with us, dear Heavenly Father. Comfort us and bless us as only you can. Help us to be the type of Christians that you're proud of. Help us to walk our walk and live godly lives, being not only sayers of the word, but doers. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe. May God bless you all. Amen.